So we are continuing with our series called Dangerous Prayers. We're doing dangerous prayers because, you know, I know we're in kind of weird times. We've talked about some comforting topics. We've talked about kind of stress dealing topics. And frankly, I just wanted us to move on. I wanted to challenge you with some deeper material and that's exactly what this is. Often we think about prayer as, hey, it is this comforting thing and it is, or it's a, uh, God fixed this problem, and it is. But there is also dangerous prayer. Prayer that is for not the timid, but for those that are saying, I am ready for more. I am ready to move on in my walk with God. I'm ready to go to a deeper level and not just always be in comforting mode. To say, God, I want you to do the work that you really desire to do, that's the territory we're in, dangerous prayer. And so we're gonna talk about one today that is not an easy one, and it may even catch you off guard. You do not, may even have a category for this uh, because of the way that you have seen God and related to God, but I'm telling you as your pastor, I am, I am banking my ability to rate, relate to you out of my experience of saying this is this is territory that you need to deal with if you want to go to these deeper places. And so it is the prayer, Lord, break me. Now when we think about broken things, usually we don't think of good things. Like how many of you have broken stuff in your house? How many of you have kids? That's about a one for one, isn't it? I mean, that's what kids do. They break things. This is why we can't have nice stuff. Uh, you know, when we were having trouble with Iran there several years back, we were worried about their, their uh, uh, nuclear program. I, I was like, don't send in the SEAL team. They're going to make a mess of it. Just, just parachute in a couple, three, five-year-olds. They'll have that place tore apart. They won't even know how to put it back together again. This is, this is the way God designed them. They, they break stuff. Uh, we used to have a, a, a table that wasn't in really good shape. It was kind of a rough table. Eileen tried to refinish it. She repainted it and it made it look better, but it was still pretty rough. And she'd She'd pine away, can't, can't we have a nice dining room table? I'm like, no, we got four little kids. They're stabbing it with forks and throwing food in places. And then Bud loved to do his uh, dinosaurs on top of it. Do you know what? how much damage a, a stampede of, of dinosaurs, like chips are flying off this thing as he's going down there? I'm like, no, this is the perfect table for us. Someday, someday we'll have something nice that doesn't get broke. I'm still waiting for that time. You know, Buddhism actually has a full philosophical teaching on this matter. It's, it's so important to us. You know what they teach? They go, the way to have peace in your life is to imagine everything you have as broken. Because that's the final state of everything. It's all going to break. So if you do that, you'll at least be grateful for the time that it's not broken. Isn't that great? It's kind of like spiritual insurance. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, that's not what we really want to do. But we've got broken things. We've got broken body parts. I, you know, I've broken some bones in my body. Uh, Zachary broke his wrist uh, years ago, and it took us a week for him to find out because it kept on hurting him. And, you know, things break. But then brokenness kind of goes more treacherous, more deeper, uh, uh, more significant, right? We can start talking about what about broken hearts? Everybody's had a broken heart. I mean, if you go way back, especially to teenagehood, that's kind of the territory of things, right? You kind of are starting to figure out, hey, I like somebody and maybe that works out, maybe it doesn't and you've had a heartache and a heartbreak, um, but becomes things become more at stake as you go along in life and you can have broken relationships, broken family relationships, broken partnerships. Um, and those things can come with some deep wounds. We, we don't like that because man, they're, they're centered on this kind of broken promises and broken trust and it can change the course of your life. 
this is not good territory for us to normally be in. And then, then there's a way that we talk about our condition as humanity and as individuals that I really kind of gravitate to. By the way, we'll go ahead. And this is the idea of, of that we are broken people. You know, so the old church language is that we are sinners. We are sinful people. We, we don't go the right way. We don't do what's right. Uh, as much as you might go, hey, people are kind of decent. And, and, and yeah, for the most part, people are decent. There are cracks in our foundation. There's this brokenness that we just can't ever seem to escape. We just kind of like, it's there. It's always lurking. Even when we kind of get on track, we've got to be always watchful of this. Because man, stuff from deep within us kind of come out. We, we are broken. Now the Bible doesn't use broken quite in that way. But certainly that language is in tune with how the Bible describes us and our experience. So there's lots of ways that we use the word broken and none of them are good. This is stuff that we want to be rescued from. This is stuff that we would like to go away. This is stuff that we want. God, can you just make this disappear? Because my life would be so much better if it wasn't broken. But then we come across this prayer in Psalms 51. David writes this, he says, speaking to God, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, my offering to God, what I'm offering to him is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you God will not despise. Now look at this here, all right? I mean, he's, he's talking about sacrifice and, and burnt offerings as, uh, you know, he's going, God, God doesn't delight in those. And we kind of get that, you know, as modern people were like, yeah, we never got that whole killing animals thing. He, he's not, he's not saying that from a modern perspective. He's going, look, God never was really interested in the ritual part. And while we don't kill animals now for kind of that, we have our own rituals, we might, if David was writing this today, go, God is not so much interested in your church attendance or your good deeds or the things that you might kind of go, you know what, this is the way that I satisfy God, that I placate God. No, what God is really interested, what he will not despise is a broken and contrite heart. Is brokenness what God really wants from us? I mean, that just doesn't seem right. Don't I come to God to get fixed? Don't I come to God to have it made better? And yet David is going, this is what you really want from us. How do we make sense of that? Well, let's, let's go into the story, the background story. This, this is by David. David was king of Israel way back when, and man, he was like knocking it out of the park. So if you remember, uh, this is kind of a late picture of him. I just took it on my cell phone the other day because um, I'm good like that. <laughs> Texted it over. Okay. Anyways, you know, he's the guy that uh, got picked to be king by God, not by the people, by God. He's the one that defeated Goliath and saved the nation. He's the one that becomes the king and people are like, you are like the best king ever. You're the best warrior ever. He's like, I know, it's great, you know. He's even a musician. He's coming out with a record soon. Like life is perfect. This guy is just overflowing with abundance and prosperity. And he's even known as the, as the, uh, the, the, the man after God's own heart. So like he's killing it spiritually too, right? He's got every aspect of his life dialed in. He's doing great. And then he had a bad day. Well, actually kind of a bad couple of weeks here. So it says that uh, it, it was later on and in the springtime he sent his army off to do some warring and, you know, keeping uh, the enemies at check. But he didn't go with them this time. He was going to kind of take a spring, right? You know, there's COVID out there. He was, no. Uh, he just said, I'm going to stay home. 
And uh, he's out on his roof one night, and he sees a pretty girl. This pretty girl's taking a bath. He's more interested. In fact, he gets so interested, he goes, I think I want to invite her over. And, you know, when the king invites you over, you answer. And one thing leads to another. And he sends her home. And then she sends him a note. Uh, two bars showed up on the stick. Oh, 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 okay. And then she's somebody else's wife. Oh, no, oh, no. So he goes through a whole bunch of kind of schemes to try and make this all okay, to cover it up, and, you know, brings her husband back, and but nothing is working. He is stuck. This is going to come out what he has done and how he's betrayed people. And so he takes the ultimate step and has her husband killed. He doesn't do it, but he just sets it up, basically. He puts out a hit on him and gets him killed. David's going, and now I can claim her as my own. It's all good. Nobody needs to know. I can just keep on rolling here, right? I'm still good with God. I'm good with the people, and I got this taken care of. I'm on top of things. Well, the prophet Nathaniel came by to visit him and said, Hey, king, I need to tell you about a few things going on. Okay, give me the report. How are we doing? Uh, Cross country says, Well, we have a situation. Uh, there's this guy that has one little goat, loves the goat, family pet, named it, lets it sleep in the house. It's the one thing that he really, really loves. Well, it got taken from him. It got taken from him by this guy that has 10,000 goats, 10,000 sheep, top of the heap. But when he wanted to have a party, he didn't take one from his own. He took this guy's all he had, just that one little family goat that he prized. And David becomes enraged as the king of going, how dare he do that? How could he wrong somebody like that? That man will pay for this. And Nathan, prophet Nathan, drops the line and he points to the king and says, you are that man. one of the most poignant moments in, in all the stories of the Bible. This man was on top. He thought he had pulled it off. He was the only one who knew. And he just got called out in a serious way, in a way that goes, everybody knows what I did. It is out of this horrible, tragic moment for him. His whole life takes a turn. The rest of his story is uh, borderline tragic from here. But David, because he had been on track with God, knew what he had to do. He stopped lying. He stopped the cover-ups. He went, I've got to go to God. And Psalm 51 is one of the ways that he processed through this. It is a psalm of repentance. And you could read that. It would be a great psalm for you to read on your own where he's just going, you got me. I'm completely guilty. No excuse. I'm completely on your mercy. I need you to show up and, and really fix this. Not my scheming, not my tricks, not my lying and deceitfulness but you need to fix this. And he ends with the line of going, my soul offering, the only thing I can deliver to you is a broken and contrite spirit. David says, yes, brokenness is what God really wants. See, brokenness in this context is more than just that he's broken uh, been shown that he's broken as an individual and he has done bad things. It is this brokenness of going, I have finally arrived at the truth. It is undeniable. I am completely laid bare. There's no more uh, illusion to this. There's no more games. There's no more tricks. This is what it is and it is undeniable. And I understand 
that I cannot change it, that I cannot move it, I can't make up for it. It's just what it is. And that's all I've got. He doesn't come to God and say, you know what? I'm going to build you a couple churches and that will make it all right. He doesn't come to God and say, you know what? I promise I'll never kill anybody again. Will that make it okay? He doesn't come to God and say, I'm going to write half of the book of Psalms for you so that people a couple thousand years from now can make songs and make uh, uh, St. Christopher uh, Tomlin rich off of these things. No, 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 no. He has nothing to offer except a broken spirit. And David says, this is what God really, really wants. Now, sometimes we, maybe in old church, it'd be going, well, yeah, because God is kind of a vengeful God and he likes people to feel really, really bad. He, he's interested in, in having these layers of guilt just kind of hang on people. And the worse that you feel about yourself, the better it is and the more enjoyment somehow he gets out of it. That is not what David means at all. He's saying, God loves this moment, this point of brokenness, because finally we're at the truth. Finally we're at the place that God can do his work. See, we have one layer of problem of going, we just... We can't get it right, folks. We have cracks in our foundation that we cannot repair. We can paint over it. We can put some goop in it. But man, the crack remains. That's one layer of problem. But our second problem is that we don't want to admit it. Brokenness, what David's talking about, is that moment when we go, well, just like him and the prophet Nathaniel, when he goes, you are the man, and it's undeniable. The illusions are gone. For some of you, you have been in that moment. You've made a disaster of things. I mean, we're talking about adultery. We're talking about murder, a cover-up murder here. Like, these are some heavy-hitting things. Some of you have done some heavy-hitting things. And I say, blessed you are. If you have come to the point of brokenness, because you no longer have the illusion that you're good. You know it. You are just completely at the mercy of God. That's a beautiful place to be. Maybe you're not there yet. Maybe you have made a disaster and you're still, no, no, no. I'm going to fix this just like David tried to fix it. I'm, I'm going to get on top of this. I, I'm going to find a way. It's all right. God is patient. Things tend to go down when we try to fix them up. And that moment waits for you of brokenness so that God can say, okay, now we can do something. For many of you though, you don't experience that with David. You know, some of you, you, you throw yourself at that mercy and you know what it is. Some of us have not been there. We still think we're good. And we usually kind of treat our uh, problems and our flaws with kind of a classic, not a classic, a, 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 a new fad line. We, we do the sorry, not sorry, right? Sorry, but no, really not. I'm going to do whatever I want to anyways. Just get over it. I want to live the way that I want to. It's not that big of a deal. I got to be me. Because that's what the TV tells me. I got to have my best life now. And this is what I need to do it. So sorry, but not sorry. I don't care that God said that that's a bad idea. I don't care that, you know, it has brought pain and grief into somebody's life. 
but how we relate to what we do. How we relate to when we go off God's path really matters. John wrote about this in his letter to a New Testament church, one of the first churches. He said, as you start your life with God, we've got to get a couple things right. In the very first chapter, he goes, there are three false ways that we can think about ourselves, that we can do the sorry, not sorry. Watch these. He goes, there's three claims that we can do. The first one is if we claim that we have fellowship with God, hey, you know, I'm tight with God. I believe in him. I go to church sometimes. I read my Bible. I, I probably even pray. I have K-love in my car. I'm good with God. And yet walk in darkness. That is his description of going, I am doing the wrong stuff. Now, th this, isn't, this isn't kind of like the accidental, the I had a bad day, the, um, you know, I'm struggling with something. This is a, no, no, I want to believe that I'm okay with God, but I can completely do whatever I want, even when it goes contrary to what he says. He says, if you claim that, you're lying. And there's no truth in you. You're, you're, you're out of your skull. So there's a second claim that we can do. If we claim to be without sin, now this isn't, let's not do the, well, of course I'm not perfect. I don't claim that. That's not what he's saying. He's, 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 do, he's closer to where we're at when we kind of go, of course I'm not perfect. I have flaws. They're not as bad as Bobby down the street. Have you heard what he was doing? Oh my goodness. You know, but we have this idea, you know what? I'm doing all right. I'm pretty good. You know, I'm not knocking anybody off. Uh, I'm not chasing women around or men around. I'm, I'm okay. He says, we deceive ourselves. Our culture tells you that. You need to have more self-esteem. You need to believe in yourself. You need to know that you're on track and just need to do whatever you want and all the things are gonna fall into place. And I'm telling you, the scriptures goes, points the opposite direction and says, no, you need to know the truth about yourself. The third claim, false claim that we can have, if we claim we have not sinned, again, this is not the perfection thing. This is not somebody going, I've never made a mistake. This is really taking the attitude of going, look, of course I got mistakes. Of course I got flaws. You know what? They're in the past and I got this. I don't need help. I don't need God in my life. You know, maybe I believe in God. Maybe I even do some religious stuff, but I really don't need God to fix stuff. I got it. John says, we make God out to be the liar then. And we haven't listened to a thing he says. John says, if you do any of these three, watch out. You're in danger. You're deceiving yourself. I can't keep on sinning, living life how I want to uh, 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 against God and say it's okay. There's a lie somewhere. I can't go, hey, I'm better than everybody else. I don't have any big problems. We need to fix everybody else. Even if you're doing all right, watch out. Any day can be a bad day. Three, I can't say that I don't need God's help. You're... Let me put the Bible's words in today's vernacular. You're cuckoo, all right? There is no pathway for you to be fixed, for this to be made right on your own. See, that's, that's the blessing of David and his disaster is he is now past these three. There's no illusion that David could ever make this mistake, is it? The veneer has been ripped off for him. 
This is what I am. And all I've got to offer is a broken spirit. So God goes, yes. When you're there, when you've given up, then I start to do my best work. John's solution to those is going, if we confess our sins, and that's church language for going, come clean, be honest with God. And the more raw honest you can be, the more God can be at work. The more you hold on to illusions, the less God can do. See, a broken spirit is abandonment into God's hands. I'm holding nothing back because I ain't got nothing to hold back to. I, I, I'm not relying on myself at all anymore. I, I've made an absolute disaster of it all, and here it is. All I have is you. God loves that moment. And it's, what, 2,000 years later, John's writing the exact same thing to a church. That's where you need to go. If you want to grow, if you want to get deeper with God, it's the same territory. Well, how about for the rest of you? You know, those of you who haven't killed somebody or kicked a cat or got caught smoking. You know, those of you that are kind of in normal moral land that think you're okay. You haven't done the things David has. Where are you at? Let me tell you one more story. So what about you guys that, that, that are pretty good? You haven't done any major big deal stuff. Well, let me finish with a story about Peter. Remember the apostle Peter, leader of the church, and he starts this whole movement thing. He has big, big things in the Bible. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. So he's just a fisherman. Jesus is starting his teaching ministry. Uh, this is in Luke 5, and um, he's got kind of a medium crowd. The crowd go grows bigger, and so Jesus goes, you know, he's a presentation guy. He's going, I need a little bit of distance so people can, can, can hear me, and if I get out on the water, you know, it's a great uh, audio thing of going, it really carries the voice. So he sees their boats there. They've given up for the day. They're cleaning their nets. They're, they're getting ready to go home. They're punching out at 5 o'clock. He doesn't ask he just gets in a boat and says, let's go out. You know, we don't get the conversation, but they're kind of like, yeah, all right, whatever. We're going to do this for the guy. Um, so they go out in the boat. He holds his service. He does all his teaching. We don't know how long it is, but it goes on for a little while. He finishes teaching. And then he tells the guy, let's go fishing. No, 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 no. Okay. You're the pastor. That's fine. You, you got the way with words, but we know fish. You're not going to tell us it was bupkis today, you know. We're not getting anything. But Peter steps up and goes, you know what, this is a silly idea. But because you asked, all right, fine. I'll, uh, I'll go along with this little charade here. And so they go out. They go out in the boat and Jesus says, let your nets down on this side. And the nets fill up with fish. They have two boats uh, Luke, Luke's careful about this. He goes, there's two boats. They're pulling the fish up in. There are so many fish, it's actually starting to sink the boats. Get this, Luke, 2,000 years ago, is writing the story, and he wants us to know they have so much fish, the boats are starting to take on water. It's not like they had a good catch. This is a ridiculously good catch. This is an unbelievable, a lifetime catch. And so Peter looks at this and he says, hey, I think this Jesus guy is going somewhere. I'm going to go follow him. I'm signing up for his church. I'm taking a membership class. I'm finding out everything about him. He is on the way to success. If I hook my train to him, we're going to go somewhere. Maybe I could get in on the ground floor and be a top general. You know, he's like imagining all these great possibilities. Apparently you haven't read Luke 5, because that's absolutely ridiculous. You know what Peter says? When Simon Peter saw this, all the fish, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me. 
I am a sinful man. Mm. Did, you, did Peter like kill somebody that day? No. He didn't cheat on his wife. He didn't rob a bank. I mean, as far as we know out of scripture, Peter has no sordid past. He's just a regular average guy. He's a fisherman. He goes to work. He goes home. He watches football on the weekends. He pays his bills. He's just an average guy. But in this moment, Peter looks beyond the fish, doesn't he? And he goes, there's, there's something deeper going on here. It, it gives this look to him, not of woo-hoo, but of brokenness, of this view of himself that is without any illusions, right? He's not trying to talk himself up. He's not trying to get a job. He's like, dude, do you know, do you know what I am? I, I, I know. And this moment somehow, mysteriously, supernaturally has opened my eyes to who I am and to who you are apart from any kind of great sinning disaster. It's a picture of brokenness, spiritual brokenness. I mean, we don't make bumper stickers for this, right? God, God makes your life better and he makes you feel better. Peter's first experience with Jesus was quite the opposite but it was the best thing that could have ever happened to Peter. Because when we come to that place of brokenness, and honestly, it's a gift. It's a gift from God to open our eyes. Sometimes we bring it on by our own disasters. Sometimes God just breaks through like here with Peter and shows us. It's a gift. Because this is the beginning of Peter's life with God. That's what I'm inviting you to. This isn't a neat trick. This isn't a, oh, if you kind of get around to this. If you want the deeper path with God, this is the territory you have to go into. You start with the dangerous prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Take your spotlight. Tell me the truth about who I am. We don't want, we want to cover stuff up. True spirituality says, no, God, I trust you. Go ahead. Full scan. Whatever you find. But then we follow up with that by going, when we know the truth, if we're willing, if we're really letting God in to say, will you break me? Well, when I see what you show me, will I dismiss it? Will I make excuses? Will I make justifications, rationalizations? Why it's okay for me? Why I'm the exception? Why I don't have to listen? Why... I know better than, than the God of the universe or do I break and I say, I get it and I understand how desperately I need you. It's harder for you people that are good. Still too easy to hold on to the illusions. So if you've had a disaster, blessed, blessed are you. I think Jesus said that, didn't he? Blessed are the poor in spirit because now they know the truth. That's what we're inviting you to. I know this isn't a great rah-rah sermon here today, but this is a moment for you to do business with God, for you to maybe open a door today that's been shut for a while, 
for you to open a door that leads to some greater things because now you are willing to say, God, I'm going to trust you at a more profound level with every bit of who I am and all the messy stuff. It's scary. It's dangerous. But who other hands would you ever want to be in? The slide I skipped over was Jesus' response. He didn't say, Peter, go out and get your act together. His response was, don't be afraid. You're exactly where you need to be. I've got you. In fact, you're now going to be on my team. See, we don't get on God's team because we bring something good. We get on his team because we understand what the truth is. We're going to have the band come up. We have the prayer areas here, and it's open. Nobody's going to pray with you because we're keeping social distancing, but I want you to know that this is time and space, and nobody has to worry about, you know, what, what is that person doing? Frankly, the more that you're focused on somebody else, the further you are from this truth. Right now, everybody has only an eyeball on themselves. But this is your space and time to say, God, are you, I'm ready for you to search me. I'm ready for you to break me, to bring me to a place where I'm only dependent on you for everything. The space is open for you now. Yeah.